Uh, thank you, Sister Grace. Uh, as we start the book of Revelation on Monday, I just gave the introduction to the book of Revelation, but we're going to go to the actual text from verse 1 of uh, Revelation chapter 1. And it begins with uh, the statement, the revelation from, of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. So revelation, the word revelation is in Greek is a word called apocalypsis, which means uncovering, uncovering, a prophetic, something we don't know, reveal. And this revelation was given by the Father in heaven to Jesus to be given to his people on earth. And uh, through John, the revelation came. Interestingly, while the Father spoke to Jesus and gave revelation, John was supposed to record the revelation, what he saw, and simply report it. Interestingly, John did not explain the revelation. After you go to the sixth chapter of Revelation until the 19th chapter, there are so many things mentioned about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls of wrath. But John doesn't explain what they actually mean. He simply presents what he received from the Lord and uh, the, the uncovering. Now, the, the word uncovering or reveal, revelation, if I give an example of what a revelation could mean, is that suppose you go to a theater for a, to see a play. And when the play starts at 6.30, there's a screen covering the stage. You don't know what is behind the, the screen. The first scene, how it's going to be. The table, chair, or people sitting there or talking, what it is, you do not know. When the screen separates, then you see behind the screen what that is, uncovering. The, the opening of the screen uncovers what is behind the screen. Till the screen uncovers, you will not know what is behind. So this revelation or everything about God revealed to us through the scriptures is by the Spirit of God to us today. The Holy Spirit reveals to us the treasures of God's word. This book of revelation was given by the Father to Jesus and to be given to his servants through uh, John, who was an island of partners. So the revelation of Jesus Christ given, which God gave him, him meaning Christ, to show his servants what must soon take place. Now soon is very relative. Time is very, very relative. Uh, if you look at 2 Peter 3.8, it says, with God, one day is a thousand years, thousand years is like one day. So 2,000 years back, it says soon to take place. It's been 2,000 years, still is not taking place. But then, like, like I said, God is outside of time. And why is God waiting to come? Why is that you know, uh, coming of second coming in Christ yet? Because God is patient with everyone. Second Peter 3 9 says, God is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with everyone not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repent. So he's waiting for people to repent, and then he will come a second time. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. There is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. What he saw, the vision that John saw, he simply wrote down. Testimony of Jesus, and the word of God, the word of God, rhema of God, instruction of God. And he was just simply faithful, write down what he saw. And then he wrote down, as you go on the first chapter, from verse 12 to 16, we see a different Jesus that we normally used to in our image, imaginary way. And therefore, as we read this, it's important for us to take to heart what the Lord says in the book of Revelation and was revealed to us today. We can understand. What's not revealed, we can't understand. So many of the book of Revelation, many aspects of this book is not revealed yet. Uh, personally, for me, it's not been revealed. And I don't think for others also, because uh, even the prophets who spoke about the first coming, they want to know when it's going to come, what time, what circumstances. They were told for another generation, not their generation. Similarly, the complete revelation of the book of Revelation what those trumpets, when they're going to be sounded, what the seals are, what the bowls of Ratha, is not revealed yet. And when he comes, he will know. So I told you to do some homework. 
Luke 21, Matthew 24. They record the events that will happen before the second coming. The beginnings of the second coming. And then, when it comes second time, what will happen is mentioned in the book of Revelation. And after it comes, what's going to happen also mentioned. So the three phases. Before coming, when it comes, after it comes. But then, the first few verses, first few chapters, it's about the uh, what John saw, he simply wrote down, and we will do well to read it. Verse 3. Blessed the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Let us understand one thing. In those days, when, for example, Paul wrote the letters to the different churches, they read the letter loudly in the church congregation. Everybody in the church did not know how to read and write. In the first century, only 3% of the population could read and write. 97% could not read and write. So all the letters of Paul and Peter were read out by someone in the church who could read and write. And everybody who were there heard what was read out of the letter. Similarly, here it says, we read out this book of Revelation, it was written down in the churches. Seven churches will come later on. And the one who reads this loudly for everyone to hear, and those who hear it, they're going to be blessed, even though they don't understand it. Because something about God's word that cleanses, that sanctifies, that builds us up. In reading the Bible loudly, will actually bless us. That's why we have read the book of Revelation. If you don't understand something, read it. You're going to be blessed by it. But in the context of that is, in the congregation, they read out loudly, someone read out, and all those who are there will listen to the word and thereby be blessed. And the word blessed here is the word called makarios, which means happy. Makarios means happy. Okay. Verse 4, John, the seven churches in the province of Asia. Asia means uh, Turkey. Asia of those days was Western Turkey, northern part of Western Turkey. And the seven churches mentioned there. And maybe Shobhana can share the screen uh, on the, the map of uh, the seven churches. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Nice, nice images. Yes. You look at this image, you'll find the seven churches mentioned, which you're going to see later on in the first three chapters, are all in a crescent, starting by Ephesus in the west, Smyrna north, and Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And Patmos is an island uh, southwest of the coast of Ephesus. Ephesus today is a place called Izmir, I Z M I R, M I R. Near Izmir are the ruins of the old Ephesus, the town of Ephesus. So these seven churches are actually in a crescent from west to north to east. Interestingly, out of seven churches, only three churches are named elsewhere in the Bible. Of course, Ephesus we know. We know about the 19th chapter of Acts, the church was formed in Ephesus. That are part of the Ephesians we know. But then Thyatira and Laodicea are mentioned twice in the Bible. That is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 14, where it talks about Lydia. Lydia was a leader in public court from the town of Thyatira. She's from Thyatira. And she was in Philippi when Paul went and uh, spoke to her and we uh, know the story about how she accepted Christ. But she's from Thyatira. And then there was also Laodicea, which is mentioned in the letter of Paul to the Colossians. But the Colossae was not one of the recipients of this uh, seven churches of uh, Revelation. But Colossae is about 160 kilometers east of Ephesus. It's not there in the map now because uh, it's not part of the seven churches of Revelation. But actually Colossae is about 160 kilometers, 100 miles east of Ephesus in the same area. And in Colossians chapter 4, 15-16, the Apostle Paul writing to the church, greet people who are in Laodicea. And he says, read out this letter loudly in Laodicea, 
And read the Laodice letter also in Ephesus. They are, he wrote a letter to Laodice also, but it's not part of the uh, Bible we have today. So Laodice has mentioned in the book of Colossians, 4th chapter 15, 16, and Thyatira, the 16th chapter of Acts, verse 14, where uh, Lydia was a businesswoman, was a leader of purple cloth from the town of Thyatira. Okay, let's go on. The seven churches in the province of Asia, meaning Turkey. When the Bible says Asia, it means Turkey of those days. Grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ. The seven spirits, which mentioned in some Bibles, it's actually sevenfold spirit. Sevenfold spirit, seven aspects of the spirit refers to the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, symbolically represented in the uh, throne in heaven, in the fifth chapter of uh, Revelation, we'll find, find later. And that uh, from him who was, who is, and who is to come, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. And it goes on to say, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth, the firstborn from the dead. Now, it's very important to understand this, firstborn from the dead, because some parts of the Bible talks about Jesus being the firstborn. For example, Colossians 1.15. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Colossians 1.15. If you look at only that one particular verse in isolation, you wonder, firstborn or all creation, that means he was born? He was not born. He was not created. He's always been there. That firstborn is firstborn from among the dead. So Colossians 1.15 is explained in Colossians 1.18. Colossians 1.18 says, firstborn from among the dead. He's always been there. He was not created. In John 1, 1, we read, in the English Bible, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word is, we know is Christ. In the Greek Bible, the word the is not there. In the beginning. In means n in Greek. Beginning, beginning means archis in Greek, A-R-C-H-I-S. And the word the is the, the. So in the beginning means en the arcus. En, in, the, the arcus. In the original Greek Bible, there's no the. In beginning. Seems very, you know, illogical to in English to say in beginning. It's not grammatically correct. So the King James translators put the word the in there. Now when you put the word the, there's a specific beginning for the word of God, the Christ. There's no beginning. They've always been there. Before man was created, Christ was there from the foundation of the world. So because it doesn't make proper English grammar, they put the, in the beginning was the word. But there's no the. It's always been there. He is, that's it. I am that I am. The Lord is. He was, is, and is to come. No beginning, no end. The Alpha and the Omega. That's Jesus Christ, the Lord. So firstborn here means from among the dead. And this verse explains Colossians 115. Firstborn over all creation. If you look at the verse in isolation, it seems to be that he was created. He was not created. He is. It's very important to understand that. That's why I always say the Bible explains the Bible. One part of the Bible is explained by another part of the Bible. So, Colossians 1 15 is explained in Colossians 1 18. And also in this particular verse, it says, Firstborn from among the dead and ruler of the king, kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power. Forever and ever. To him who loves us and the freedom, freedom from our sins 
by his blood. The blood of Christ not only has cleansed us of our sins that we have right before God, removed a bad conscience, he also frees us from our sins. He draws us out of sins by his blood. Like for example, it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Galatians 1, 4 says about Christ, he gave himself for our sins, rescue us from this present evil age. Titus 2.14, he gave himself for us, redeem us from all wickedness. So he draws us out of sin. Not only he forgives our past sins, he draws out of sin. He makes us holy. That's the Lord we serve today. He has freed us from our sins by his blood. That blood is precious blood. Perfect blood. Because it came from a life that was sinless. So here it talks about how he loves us. He has freed us from our sins by his blood. Therefore, we don't have to continue in sin now. We should not continue in sin. Because he has given us everything we need to be out of sin and to live a life that pleases God because by the Holy Spirit's power, who is given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, he announces with the Holy Spirit, we put to death the mysteries of the sinful nature. Through the Spirit, we put to death the mysteries of our sinful nature. And therefore, all of us Christians can choose to live a life of holiness, but depending upon the resources that have been given to us by the divine power of God. Going back to 2 Peter 1.3, 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. To be godly means to be like Jesus, to imitate his life. To be able to imitate his life, he's given us all the resources we need. And one of them is the blood of Christ, the cleanses of every sin. We us from our sins by his blood, it made, it made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to whom be glory and power forever and ever. Verse 7. Look, is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Who pierced him. In fact, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10, it says, they look upon the one whom they have pierced. Who have pierced? The Jews with the help of the Romans. They pierced him, nails into his hands and legs, and a sword unto his side. And they will look upon the one they have pierced. They'll wonder how, what, what, what they did to him. One day when he comes, second time when he comes, they'll all understand what they did, the Jews. So it says, they look on the one they have pierced, he'll come with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all people in earth will mourn because of him. Now you can begin to wonder how every eye will see when he comes a second time. Today we understand that. Today we understand that because the social media is there, the TV channels are there, CNN is there, BBC is there. When he actually comes, they might know what's going to happen when he comes. All the TV channels will be there with the cameras on the Mount of Olives. He's going to come on the Mount of Olives. He'll come in the clouds. Remember that time, the book of Acts, in chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. As looking upon him, looking at him, he went up into heaven. A cloud covered him. He went up into heaven. Suddenly a cloud came. They couldn't see him anymore. And then they were all wondering where he went. The angel says, just like he went up, he will come. He'll come in the clouds. And we'll all look upon him and all the TV channels will be there when he comes second time. You know what will happen when he comes second time? To come on the Mount of Olives, it is split in two from east to west. 
Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. They split in two, east to west. One part goes north, the other part goes south. And then he enter the temple in Jerusalem, which is by that, that time be built. They're going to build the third temple, the Jews. Who will occupy the third temple? The man of Lord's sins will occupy. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 8. That temple in Jerusalem is going to be built later on. They're not preparing the, the utensils for the third temple in Jerusalem even today. And it will be occupied by the man of lawlessness who think who pretend to be God. And as Christ comes the second time, he'll enter the temple through the east gate. And by the breath of his mouth, he will destroy the one who occupies the temple, the evil one, the man of lawlessness. That's what the Bible says. Very exciting things going to happen, but I don't know if it happen in our lifetime or not. The Bible says it is near, it is soon. How soon, we don't know. But uh, it will happen maybe at the right time. Of course, at the right time, we may or may not be there. That doesn't matter. But all the people going to be there at that time will see him and they will mourn for what happened before they crucified him on the cross. Especially Jews. Jews will really feel bad they crucified him. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is, who was, who is to come, the Lord Almighty. So what does it say here? The Alpha and the Omega is Jesus, and he's also the Lord Almighty. Again, confirming the divinity of Christ. The Lord Almighty is the Alpha and the Omega, who is Jesus Christ. How many verses there are in the Bible talk about the divinity of Christ? This is one such verse. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, God, who is, who was, and who is to come. Then look at verse 9. Now, John explains the vision he sees. I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Christ Jesus was the island of Patmos because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Yes, I was the island of Patmos because of the word of God and testimony of Jesus. I testified about Jesus. I shared the word of God. I got arrested, put in prison in Patmos. I was there because of the word of God testimony, not because something wrong I have done, but for the sake of the gospel. And he says, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient in the of Christ Jesus. So which means John also suffered. Sometimes he began to wonder whether being very close to Jesus, the Lord spared him suffering. I will be sharing on Monday also about how when the Lord told Peter how he is going to glorify Jesus in his old age, by suffering for the Lord. And Peter, being curious about John, is asking Jesus, what about him, Lord? 21st chapter of John, from verse 18. The Lord told Peter, when you are young, you girded yourself and went where you wanted to go. When you are old, someone else will gird you or dress you up and take you do not want to go. And this way, the Lord is telling Peter how he would glorify Jesus in his old age, when you're old. The Peter immediately is curious. And he, God tells him, you must follow me. You must follow me to the very end. Peter is curious about John. What about him, Lord? In other words, what about John? He also suffer like me. I know he's very close to you. You say, I'm going to suffer for you. What about him? And the Lord tells Peter, if I want him to remain till I come back, what is that to you? Moral language, none of your business. Based on that particular verse, many people assume that maybe John did not suffer. But John had to suffer. He mentions here he's suffering. And just to pacify Peter, Lord could have said, don't worry, Peter, even he'll suffer. He didn't do that. He didn't want Peter to be concerned about John. Moral language, mind your own business. You do fulfill my purpose for you. If I want to remain till I come back, what is that to you? We all know fully well that he didn't remain until Jesus came back. He died. 
That means he fell asleep in Christ. But here John confirms, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering kingdom and patient endurance that are in Christ Jesus. Kingdom is what? While living in this world, how do you enjoy kingdom? Power of God. Power to live a holy life. Power to face suffering. Power to do miracles. Power to love. Power to, for, for every aspect of Christian life. Because 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And the word power here is a word called dynamis, from where we get the English word dynamite. Explosive, visible, tangible power. So kingdom of God is power. Power to endure hardships. For example, when Timothy suffered and was ashamed to testify about Jesus and ashamed of Paul the prisoner, Paul writes to him. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. By the power of God. Kingdom of God is power, but the power you can patiently endure. I, your a companion, the suffering kingdom, power of God. Also, kingdom of God is Romans 14, 17. Not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So John is saying, all of us share this kingdom. We share suffering. And we are called to patiently endure. To patiently endure, he empowers us. That's why Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 5, 2 Timothy 4 5, endure hardships. When persecution comes, sometimes we have to endure, it won't go immediately. And this is what Paul also wrote to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. When we are cursed, we are blessed. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. What an amazing response to difficult people, troublesome people. When they curse, we bless. When they persecute, we endure. How can we endure persecution? With the power of God, which is part of the kingdom of God. So suffering, kingdom, and patient endurance, which are ours in Christ Jesus. All three are ours. So John also suffered. Not that he escaped suffering. All the people in the Bible, the apostles, went through a lot of difficult times. They are very violent deaths. There's, there's a church history records how these apostles died. All had very violent deaths. But then they had amazing rewards in heaven. They have amazing rewards in heaven. So remember, all of us share with all these people the kingdom, peace and joy, power, suffering, to the extent we can handle suffering and patiently enduring the suffering. And God is so faithful. According to how much strength they have, we'll face suffering. First Corinthians 10 13. So this verse explains, ninth verse, that even John had suffering, enjoyed the kingdom, endured suffering patiently, because this endurance comes from hope. God bless us. We'll go on the 10th verse on. On Friday. So we finished nine verses today. And up to uh, fifth chapter, I'll be able to, six, uh, fifth chapter, I'll be able to uh, go verse by verse. Thereafter, I don't know. I have no revelation of the seals and the trumpets and the bowls and all that. All the private interpretation most people do. I'll only restrict myself to whatever God revealed to me. What revelation or revelation I've got, partial revelation of revelation, I will share with you. The rest we will leave it to God at the right time. If you happen to be alive when he comes, we'll know the whole thing, follow revelation. God bless you all.